and welcome to Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control, a podcast of the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control, Training and Technical Assistance, or ARC-IPC. My name is Mina Napavi, and I'm a program manager with the ARC-IPC at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. The FDA's expert panel on vaccines met last week, that was Thursday, January 26th of 2023, to discuss the future use of the bivalent COVID shot, signaling the start of the FDA's pivot to a longer-term immunization strategy. This is an important first step in a process that could result in millions of Americans receiving an annual COVID booster, similar to the flu vaccine. Any such changes will require more discussion and decisions, but the FDA appears to be shifting from responding to the pandemic's acute phase to a longer term norm. And as a point of reference, we are recording this podcast on February 1st, 2023. To speak more about this topic in the meeting last week, We have invited Dr. Suzanne Judd, director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy and a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham to join the podcast. Dr. Judd is no stranger to the podcast, and we are always grateful to have her on the show. So thank you again for being here, Dr. Judd. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So like I mentioned earlier, the FDA's advisory panel on vaccines met last Thursday and discussed ways to simplify the COVID-19 vaccines. What does that mean? So basically, that means that they have enough evidence now that they can look through a a vaccine strategy with vaccines that are off emergency use authorization. Uh, Folks may or may not remember from the past that when vaccines first started rolling off, they were uh, on something called emergency use authorization, which just means that the FDA thinks there's enough evidence that it's it will do more good than harm. So even though they're not ready to say 100% safe, they're pretty sure that it's it's safe enough for use. Um, now that, that the vaccines are starting to come off emergency use, plus new vaccines are coming on, the FDA met to decide what are we going to do with all of these new vaccines that will roll out annually, similar to the way the flu vaccines roll out annually. So they've got a strategy now that they're going to roll out for looking at different vaccines and deciding what an ideal vaccine schedule might be. So what, before we look, move forward, what are the current vaccine recommendations for COVID-19 as of today, February 1st, 2023? The current recommendations are still those first two shots, a first and a second dose if you've never had any COVID vaccine at all. And then you move into the booster phase. At the moment in the booster phase, they're recommending what's called a bivalent vaccine, which means has more than one strain of SARS-CoV-2 in the vaccine. Uh, But that again, that's only if you've had those first couple of vaccines. So why do vaccine schedules need to be updated? And when these advisory panels are meeting, what type of data do they consider? So viruses like SARS-CoV-2 or influenza they can mutate over time. They can change so that different strains of the the virus are circulating and you might need a slightly different type of of vaccine. That means the vaccine schedules have to be updated. Another thing that can happen to update vaccine schedules is technology might change. We saw this in real time with COVID when we saw um, the introduction of the mRNA vaccines. So the vaccine manufacturers can actually change what's in the syringe, um, either the media that the, the uh, particles are, are suspended in, like the liquid, or the preservative, um, or even the actual active agent. All of those can change, and when they change, vaccine schedules might get updated. Another factor that can influence the vaccine schedules being updated is that vaccines can be combined together. And most of you out there are very familiar with that because you've either had something called a DTaP, um, which is your diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine, or you might have had an MMR, which is measles, mumps, and rubella. Those are all vaccines where the manufacturer has figured out how to get multiple viruses or bacteria into one vaccine so that people don't have to get multiple shots. Right, because no one likes to get stuck more than they have to. So. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a way to, to keep the consumer happy. So they only have to get stuck once instead of three times. Well, and that leads nicely into kind of my next question. I believe you know, only 15% of the U.S. population has gotten that updated bivalent booster that you talked about previously. Do you think that having a single vaccine against COVID-19 for both 
primary people who have never gotten vaccinated and booster doses would go a long way, you know, in making the process less complicated, you know, getting more people vaccinated, children vaccinated, because I know vaccination rates for children have been extremely low as well. They have been. They have been. And, and that's another thing you'll see when um, the federal advisory panel meets. If they can get the, the vaccine added to the recommended vaccines for children, you'll start to see the, those children vaccination rates go up quite a bit. Um, but that's more of a public health uh, strategy rather than the vaccine itself. In terms of the complication, yes, if they if the if the FDA could come up with one type of vaccine, uh, like the bivalent booster, wh- whatever it is that they decide based on evidence is the the single vaccine that's the best, that would go a long way to get consumers vaccinated, to get people to their local CVS or to their doctor, so that they feel that the process is um, more straightforward and that they have some kind of control over what's going on, which having more control and and understanding often um, makes people more willing to get vaccinated. So absolutely, uh, that it will reduce complication and make people more likely to go in and and get those vaccines. So control, understanding, convenience. Are there any other advantages of an annual vaccine versus periodic booster shots? It really depends on the infectious agent. Um, and, And that's one of the things I do worry about with COVID is that it may not be an annual vaccine, especially if it it mutates in such a way that we have to have a a vaccine made more rapidly. Um, Really annual vaccines are just convenient. They're they're just um, something that people can do for influenza, for example. We know that influenza mutates rapidly, so it does need a regular booster um, annually. So that's why we have the annual, but there are plenty of other vaccine schedules that are not annual. Um, They they either may be more odd, like every two years, every five years, every 10 years. Um, and then there are some that needed to happen more commonly, um, in particular, some of the um, the bugs that attack your gut that, that give you stomach flus. The vaccines that they're looking for in those cases um, require a more frequent schedule. So really, it just depends on the, the bug itself, whether the virus, the bacteria, whatever you're vaccinating against, and the way that that particular virus mutates. So all those things together probably annually, yes, is is going to be the simplest for COVID-19. So we know that vaccines for COVID are are safe and effective, and that's really been the messaging throughout the pandemic. What is the expectation for the future with the virus as a whole in terms of how vaccines are dealing with it, right? COVID has been around for a little over three years, which is is hard to comprehend that it's been three years, versus influenza has been around for over 100 years. We know a lot more about influenza. We do in terms of vaccination for influenza, but actually coronaviruses are are just as old as um, influenza viruses. So in terms of them being in the population, we know the way that coronaviruses circulate. We're familiar with coronaviruses. We're brand new to vaccinating against coronaviruses. That's what makes it unique. Uh, so I think that that the public health community will continue to collect data. They'll continue to learn how often um, someone might need to be vaccinated uh, against a SARS-CoV-19, a coronavirus. It, it may very well be that in some cases, people that are immunocompromised, um, potentially undergoing chemotherapy, that there might be reasons why people would have to get vaccinated more often than annually. It just depends on what we learn about how the immune system responds to this particular virus. So I know when the FDA met last week, they proposed a plan to convene their vaccine advisors each year in May or June to assess whether the COVID-19 vaccine should be changed to more closely match whatever strains of the virus are circulating at that time. But, you know, in the three years that COVID-19 has been around, we've seen surges in summer, fall, spring, winter, right? Are these surges related? And if so, is fall the best time to begin a vaccination campaign? That's a great question. And honestly, that's probably the million dollar question in this vaccine debate for for, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I don't think we have enough data to suggest that fall is ideal the way that we do for influenza. Influenza is really an annual virus um, with surges most commonly seen in the winter. And we can take a look at what happens in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly in Australia, and uh, determine what we might see up here in the Northern Hemisphere. So we usually look in May or June 
at what's circulating in Australia and decide what would be in a booster or, or a new influenza vaccine in the fall um, here in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm not convinced that COVID will be um, behave the same way that influenza did. It tends to mutate more rapidly, as you've all seen, um, where there's a, a brand new variant that comes out and winds up widespread in the population three months later. Um, it doesn't have that long latency that influenza does. So it's possible that, that we may just be getting annual uh, boosters, but they could come any time of the year. They won't correspond necessarily to that same fall timing of influenza. However, like we talked about in the beginning, if it turns out that it's easier just to put influenza and COVID in the same shot, and that's what gets people in annually for just one shot, then you might see a, a fall vaccination campaign. Uh, but that would be more for ease than for scientific purposes. So, you know, I know this was kind of the first step or the first meeting to discuss these issues. What what do the next steps look like? And, and when can we expect to hear more information about what the future of COVID-19 vaccinations is going to look like. We should hear something early this summer that they should meet again and hopefully we'll come up with a, a schedule that they're recommending. Uh, I'd be surprised if they push it off by one more year. There's, there's plenty of data now for them to make this decision. So I do think we'll get that guidance we're looking for in the next three or four months so that we have an idea of what is the best um, practice. But take that with a grain of salt because it is possible that um, since coronaviruses do mutate so rapidly that we'll get new evidence each year and the FDA uh, will have to reevaluate the way that the, the virus is spreading, the way the vaccines are working and, and come up with a slightly different schedule. But there should be a regularity to it that we haven't experienced just yet. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Judd, for this very timely and informative podcast. You've provided a lot of great information, and I hope that in three or four months when the FDA hopefully meets again, we can invite you back for another podcast. That sounds great. Perfect. And thank you for listening. Please tune in next time for another episode from Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control. 